This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm so happy to be speaking with two friends and fellow podcasters and therapists, Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Ann and Sue, thank you so much for being my guests on Therapy Chat today. We're we so excited be to be here. Happy to be here. We're going to be going <laughs> jinx. <laughs> well, we're both. We, we, it, it, this is, you know, we're friends, and yet we don't get to see each other very much or talk to each other very much, but we're connected to the podcasting vibes. And we were just talking before we went on about how long the three of us have been doing it and inspiring each other. Yeah, we've all, we all are coming up on ninth year, which we, that sounds weird. <laughs> it's like I'm used to saying eight, but when I say nine, it's like, oh. Well, and and, and in normal year, you know, that's podcast years, which, you know, it's like times eight or something, right? Because, <laughs> you know, what percentage of podcasts keep going after a year even? That's true. Uh, so, yeah. Even six months is the yeah, usual. Exactly. Six months. Yeah. We started, um, we, we all three started when you had to tell people what a podcast was and how to listen to them. Still some people, many people don't know yeah. what a podcast is, but um, I didn't even know what one was when I started mine. So, And Laura, we have so much respect for your show, um, you, your guests and your consistency and the quality where you're really talking about um, more depth uh, topics and conversations. Fantastic. Um, we were talking also about there's a lot out there that aren't necessarily kind of as content driven. Um, and so, yeah, kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and same to you, your show therapist uncensored is super, super popular. And I know the amount of work that goes into it. Yes. And <laughs> y'all talk a lot about research on your show, which that requires a lot of work too to get the research that you want to bring into the episode. So, you know, I'll, I'll admit it's easier to talk to people without, you know, having, you know, without ha without I know what I'm generate, talking about and what yeah. they're talking about to You're an right. extent. And I don't have to do any research to, yeah. you know, other than looking at what their, you know, latest thing is, if they have a book or something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that takes a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But now you have a book. That's true. Um, and, and, you know, with ours, it's kind of a combination of bringing people on. Um, and both of us have had incredible guests on our show. It's just such a blessing and, and fortune um, of riches to be able to talk to some of these people that are thought leaders in the field internationally. Um, but yeah, and then Ann and I do talk on our own and like kind of pro figure it out and process it and translate it. Um, so it's really nice balance. It feels like a little bit of the, the best of both worlds. And then being able to do it with my partner, that's even better. So it's pretty good. We're set up. It's true. It's true. But we get to like empty it out in real life. Like we talk about secure relating. Yeah. And, and insecure every relating. <laughs> every once in a while, we really do ask each other, do you think you're relating securely right now? <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, when we're asking each other that question, the answer is usually no. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Wow. That's, um, that's aspirational, <laughs> inspirational and aspirational for me. Well, actually at the moment, it's not usually felt that way by the other person, but truthfully, it really does. It, as much as if one person says that to the other, it, you know, of course can be irritating. And yet then it actually is a good reminder and it really is combing. Like it's like, because what it does is it directs you back inside yourself. And so at first, when you're really mad at somebody, you don't 
to be directed inside, you know? And it's like, mm, okay, maybe I'm not. And so I'm teasing and saying that we say that, but also it really is helpful, you know, was kind of remind yourself, okay, do a gut check. How am I relating? How am I going across? And that's really the core of our book, Secure Relating, is how to take all that we know. You're so sweet. <laughs> She's holding up the book. Nice. So you're not visual. <laughs> it's floating across the screen. It's it's a great cover, don't you think? It's beautiful. Yeah, I do. And I see the rainbow. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Sort of. The spectrum. That's, that's right. the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, um, before we go any further into talking about your book, let's just give you a chance to both of you to introduce yourselves and tell our audience from your own words a little more about who you are, what you do, where you're located. When did I go first? <laughs> so uh, we're located in Austin, Texas. I am a psychologist. The fun thing about is that you may, well, Ken listeners, listeners of our show may notice that Sue has her style and I have my style and of course that's personality driven but we also have different trainings and mm-hmm. we just attended a conference that really highlighted that in my mind so i've heard both thinking about that and it really loves the combination so i'm a licensed psychologist and so i come at things a little bit differently than sue does and she sue's a licensed social worker so she, you'll notice that sue is amazing about holding like the world and the concept of social justice in this beautiful rounded way, right? And just really bringing it, bringing guests on and really holding that into the podcast. And then my focus is how are we going to reach the individuals out there? You know, what are the, what's going to help connect people to sort of the, the relational aspect? And I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. You and I haven't even talked about this, but um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about the differences. So my background is all a licensed psychologist worked for a long time in, in role with uh, general offenders, violent general offenders, to help do some deep trauma work to you know, be able to circumvent incarceration, really deep relief and rehabilitation rather than incarceration. So that was the first part of I've been in private practice. Since then, working as therapy, love it, love it, looking and using the relation part. And then so I've been doing the podcast now together writing together about these and rules on topics around you know we can here violence racial or attachment and bring them up together to help people relate in the most passionate way Beautiful. so you can tell she's the nice one <laughs> Well, actually, she's just nice publicly. <laughs> so what she'll do is she'll say, why do we care? Why do we care? Which is great because it, that's yeah. exactly what you're saying, right? Is like, we can talk about all these theory and da, 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 and then, you know, it's like, what does it matter? Why would anybody care to listen? Which is such a great question. Um, and we really work to keep, you know, people listen to podcasts, as you know, Laura, like it's a personal relationship. And it's an intimate experience. It really is because, you know, we're in people's ears and love that and honor that. And so a lot of times we channel that. And I think that's some of what Ann channels for sure. Um, but just very quickly. Uh, so Sue Marriott, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and certified group psychotherapist. I'm kind of a group geek. I've been doing groups for, I have groups that have been going for, I don't even know how many, like decades, <laughs> like long time. Uh, love them. Highly recommend them. Fantastic way to heal and grow and they're less expensive. So uh, they're scalable. Um, and then what else? Uh, I think, I mean, that's the main thing. I've, you know, uh, Dan Siegel's book, The Developing Mind, just blew my mind and uh, ended up get, gathering therapists together. We started Austin in Connection, which is a nonprofit now. It's been going for, I don't know how many years. <laughs> I'm so bad at calendars, but at least. 15, 20 years, I don't know, um, where that we would bring in. And that's how I got to meet so many people, Dan and Alan Shore and all the Mm. Steve Porges, Stan Tatkin, all of those folks. uh, We just kind of were scrappy and we, that was way back then. And we would just kind of squirm our way in and meet them and bring them down. And so I've studied directly with Dan and Alan um, and Stan uh, for a little while. And um, Bonnie Badenock, there's been, you know, we've worked with her. 
um, so many, so many. Pat Ogden uh, done some sensory motor work. Uh, so lots of training from lots of different places. But I think the big thing that we, Ann and I like to do is not be focused on one particular style of training or, or, or one person that we're training under, um, that we really like to translate this for, you know, a wide, wide audience. And I think the more that you deep dive, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, your silo can become, you know, we begin to talk to the choir sort of. So, yeah, the training that she's talking about is this group training that we were just at. And man, talking about getting out of your silo, it's an international conference, people from all over the world and people, you know, hold things very, very differently. And it's wonderful. So, yeah, it's good. It's fun. So in your practice, do you two work in one private practice together? No. We that, have would be hor- that would be horrifying. <laughs> we, have, we have enough togetherness and doing the podcast and writing the book together, which is wonderful. But no, we have very separate. Awesome. We, we know enough. I hope that didn't sound rude. We know enough to know <laughs> that, you know, we have so many overlaps that we need the, uh, we need the distance there. And, and, and partly too, it's like, that's a way of expressing uh, some of that just the differences in the way, like Anne's a big couples therapist, by the way, really, really mm-hmm. great um, couples therapist. And I don't do couples. <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> mm-hmm. But we I'm do. Ter- I'm terrible at it. It is in our, our individual clinical practice and just tracking a lot, integrating some of this really, really amazing science of neurobiology and attachment that we talked about again, trying to and like how to really communicate it to people that we're working with. That uh, Sue and I together collaborated to generate some of the things that are in the book directly about, uh, we have some visuals and things like that, that has, we have each found personally really helpful in our clinical practices to use these kind of things to help people de-shame themselves, like, and really have a deep compassion and like, oh, I'm actually going into the scenery not because I'm a, you know, hysterical it's because my active nervous system is in a really in protective mode or i'm shutting her off and i go to the office and don't even think about my partner not because i don't care about them it's because i'm real to deactivate my attachment system to protect myself throughout my life i really love my family and they don't believe me because i'm at work all the time so it's like we found ways together to communicate with our clients in a way that i think was really important and helpful which of course will motivated our podcast. And I'm sure like you or we wanted to get things out to people that couldn't come to our office or to spread it and mm-hmm. really have accessibility and podcasts have been amazing that way. People that couldn't afford to walk into an office and do it can get all sorts of information. And then we wrote this book. Again, not everybody listens to podcasts and we wanted you to have one thing where you could dive deep and really develop a deeper understanding of how your body works how your relationship might be inspiring. And of course, we all have to know that how as a society right now, we're blowing up. And so we were very motivated at this time to write a book talking about how do we all get our nervous system in a way that we can connect instead of create all this division and polarization. Good. Thank you. Um, Yeah. And I mean, that's a topic that I've been talking about with a lot of people lately, like, you know, it can feel so helpless the way that there's so much chaos and so much violence. And I feel like I say that frequently. There's so much chaos. There's so much violence. There's so much pain. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are saying, whose fault is it? Who can, who's to blame for this? Who, who can we make, you know, suffer and this will go away, you know, and that doesn't work. Um, so it's not about othering people. It's about us all coming together. And that is possible through our nervous systems. And I think the more that message can be shared, the better for all of us. Um, you know, like you, you mentioned I think you mentioned Stephen Porges. It's like, you know, the, the polyvagal theory and Deb Dana talks about with glimmers, it's like, it spreads the positive relating secure attunement attachment can 
and secure relating can spread. Um, that's exactly just like fear and hate can yes, spread. That's you know? exactly kind of our hope. We kind of talk about creating little ripples of security around you and um, that that if enough people do that, it can really, really change things, you know, and I, you know, the other way that we think of it is um, like the culture, you know, society as one big nervous system that you're right, that is activated and there's been no relief and no healing. And that the truth is that the science tells us that when we're activated, we are not in our higher mind. So things are more polarized. Things are more divided. There's good guy and bad guy. Things are black, white versus versus when we are able to move back into a secure state um, that we're more generous, we're less prejudiced, we're able to tolerate difference. We can get into nuance and discernment about policy and what happened and seeing our part. And so the advantages of really having a practice to learn how to recenter yourself and get yourself, like noticing, first of all, that you're activated at all. Because when we're activated, we don't know it. We just think we're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, but noticing that and then moving back into a place of more relationality that makes you safer, which makes your people safer, which brings them back into their safe relating zone. And that's what we mean by it spreading. So yeah. it's right on it's right on the money as far as what we're hoping that uh, these conversations can promote. And again, thank you for what you're doing to try to change, to make change, you know, um, that, that you must be the change you wish to see in the world. You can't be like, someone needs to really do something about this. You have to do it. <laughs> it's so true. And I, you know, I like been there, right? Like I have been the culprit of externalizing my rage and putting my hand in the air and like, who's going to, do something about that and feeling really helpless. So I, you know, I think we all are so tempted to do that. And one example, you know, is we will stop the gonna go wait, how are we gonna reinjure our nervous system? I mean, the same as we talk about here, I conflict with somebody and they soften even just a little bit in a really compassionate way. Even when you're not quite ready to, your whole body goes. You know, have you ever had somebody apologize almost too early? <laughs> you're like, no, yes. I want to get all my rage out. And they drop like, oh my God, you're <laughs> so right. And all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, I'm not finished being mad. <laughs> but, you know, you can, we can relate to how that our entire nervous system starts to melt. And when we just move a small degree, so does the person next to us and the person next to us. And that's really what we're all needing right now. And we need to know how to do it because it's, we can't just tell ourselves, you know, hey, quit doing that because we have systems all jacked up. You could do what to do, but you're not going to do it. You know, you really have to have, like, you have to have more and to do it on a continuous basis. So I like what y'all are saying about those riffles, you know, we can do it with each other. And with it, so I like to say with your favorite people, but also your newspaper people, like that's our challenge, right? Is right. like what you were saying, Laura, not othering them. Because it's yeah. so easy to be mad. Like, the, really, the problem's out there. Man, I can fall into that thing so easily. And I have to remind myself over and over again that that's not going to get us anywhere. It's going to be our whole nervous system coming into connection with other people. Right. Right. And, you know, it's like we, um, what you said about when we're activated and we feel very right. It's like, they just need to do this and they just need to do this. And, you know, but what do I need to do? What's, what can I do? And, you know, the, the disempowerment space is to be like, somebody should really do something about this. And empowerment says, well, what can I change? What am I going to do? So, so what you're doing here with your book is you're kind of challenging, I would say, certainly the popular narrative, but also um, some older ideas in our field about what attachment is and what it looks like. And I have noticed that, you know, maybe in the past, like 10 years, particularly in popular culture, people have become aware of the different attachment styles and really like run with it. Like, oh, well, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. And um well, I, you know, it's almost like the Enneagram or something. It's like, oh, I'm a four. I can only do blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, 
that's not really the way it works. So let's talk about first, why are you proposing or sh- teaching in your book a, a different way of looking at attachment? And then what is the different way that you're looking at it? So the, you know, the history is over 70 years old uh, when this got started and you're right. It's most people think, including therapists that, and and these quadrants, which, you know, if it's helpful to kind of, you know, self guess and things like that, because that, you know, that's great. But what we really saw was that, you know, it's not intuitively accurate. I'm not just preoccupied. I'm, you know, I'm not just always disorganized even. Um, So as we really thought about that and there's subcategories, when you really go into the research, the other thing is like attachment means different things to different people, different researchers, they measure it differently. We've got developmental attachment, but even within developmental attachment, there's so many different names of everything um, depending on the researcher, which then changes some of what they're looking at. And then there's adult attachment, which is actually hardly related to the developmental attachment, um, which is really interesting. So they're, they're measuring something different than what developmental attachment is. And I I don't know if we'll have time to go into what that is, but it's actually really interesting um, that, you know, what it is. So what we've done is rather than these big quadrants, we are, we use like um, color and uh, visuals to make it very, very easy to learn and the, just the gist is you want to describe the spectrum, man. Sure. Just so that sure. I'm not. I, yeah. Well, and I liked that you were just barely tapping on, and I, that's all we can do is barely tap on that the adult and the, the developmental are different. Here's just one really quick summary about that. Like the developmental attachment is what impacted, and this is related to the spectrum, is what impacted your neurological development at a very young age. And it's really in your implicit memory. So it's a lot of your unconscious defenses, what makes you feel threatened, what makes you feel, you know, when you feel threatened, do, does your body protect itself by shutting down from, from those that are um, trying to attach to you? Or does it fully focus on, you know, fearful of rejection? And the adult attachment is much more focused on what you think about yourself. How do you, you know, and this is really oversimplistic, but it's more conscious to your beliefs about yourself. So you can see that sometimes, especially those that feel super confident, no, I'm a very connecting person. Those aren't always the most connecting individuals, right? So our conscious belief about ourselves is not the same as how our body functions when we're under threat. So that's a quick summary about kind of how we get, and they both measure different things that are important, but it's, they are very different. And Sue and I really see things on a continuum and we're not alone, right? We talked about a lot of the research that started looking at that we don't fall into quadrants and that we fall into dimensions instead. So the spectrum is about how our nerve, we have predictable ways to protect ourselves. Often either over the years, learned the patterns of upregulating and we call that going towards the red where we're very focused or we can become more and more focused on those that are in our relationship and are they rejecting us or are they living away from us? And so that we become very more vigilant. And that's the side where people talk about being um, preoccupied or uh, a wave. Stan Tankin talks about that being a wave. And then they call it red. And then going down the continuum is when you kind of were shut down and you've been trained that you not need to rely on yourself more than other people. And so you kind of disengage from other people and cut off and downregulate. What are your thoughts? And one of the, what did I miss yeah. Out? And one of the important parts about it is um, that it's a, that it's a gradient, meaning you can be just a little bit withdrawn, right? It doesn't mean that you're dismissing attachment or whatever. You can be a little bit, you know, that, and what's hopeful about that is as people get to know their own reactions better in their own unconscious patterns, we can get more, you know, so so our clients will come in and be, you know, like they'll, they're not red, but they might be, you know, whatever, like an orange or a, you know, a teal color or a, um, which we really encourage because it creates both the creativity, but also the, the really nuanced movement because the quicker that we can catch leaving the, uh, you know, our secure zone and, you know, it's what it's designed for is when we're actually in danger, when you're in danger, then by all means, right. Like get vigilant, shut, you know, pull back. Those are welcome. And there is real danger. And that's, 
that's all good. But we're, what we're focusing on is more attachment uh, patterns and kind of our, our tendencies and things like that. That's another thing is we don't, we call it, um, we have a map that we pin onto the, onto the spectrum that sort of represent, it does represent internal working models, like Anne said, which is that, the very, very deep, implicit, unconscious neural learnings about what makes you safe, but then also stories on top of that about I'm worthless or I am worthy or people will be there for me. Those aren't thoughts that we actually have, but it's embedded in our body and it just will come out. So yeah, so the, so there's the gradients of the color. Then there's also the maps that get pinned on the spectrum that kind of represents those more stable patterns um, that, that, you know, that would correspond some to the quadrant quadrants, except that what we know now with, from attachment research is that that early relationship is just one of many, 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 many relationships that have been internalized over time. Um, including, you know, if you're, if you are a person of color and you're raised in a system that is very in a neighborhood, for example, that's very dangerous, that's going to be part of your map. Um, if, if you are in a privileged position and things have come to you very easy and you have all these healthy, healthy and unhealthy narcissism and assumptions that you're going to be taken care of. That's in your map and that affects how you relate. So it, the map concept is wider than the internal working models and it includes history, our people's history. It includes um, our a close coach that may have really changed your life in a positive way, right? So it's very much more dynamic and complex. And the last thing I want to say about the maps is that we pin them, on, you know, with a little stick pin showing that they can move, even though they are more stable traits, that especially the more you're, you have experiences either with therapists or with safe people um, of safety in that green zone, and then you learn how to move your way back into the green zone over time and through relationships, those, even those maps that are more stable can move towards the green zone, meaning kind of more often, more secure relating. So it's very hopeful, very exciting. Lots you can do. I love some more. And a great example of that is watching that happen with couples. And, a, and that is, you have individuals that like maybe have been together long enough that they're having these really predictable conflicts. And so our, our brains are prediction machines. And so we're like, all you need to do is do say three words and I know where you're going, you know? And so now our bodies are already ready to react. And they, that happens over and over and over again. So then our maps are kind of landing very predictably with who we're with. And what is really exciting is to see people really develop a deeper way of connecting so that they, their body starts to feel more trust. And so their system starts to come down, calm down. And then to see them like build sort of a secure way of being together. And I love watching that over and over because they're becoming more secure, not just in the relationship but in their whole body, right? Like you can feel the difference. They feel more secure in their whole body because they've done that with a careful person and they feel more trust in the world. And you see that. It's really beautiful to see that shift. Yeah. I, I would love to talk a little bit more about all of this um, because, you know, when we started talking before we started recording, um, we were talking about, like you said, the research that's been done on this, on attachment is 70 years old. And, but also like, who were the researchers and who were they researching? And, um, the answer is white people, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's There's Eurocentric, it's heteronormative. Yes. Absolutely. There's even statistics about this. I don't remember. I'm not going to be able to say exactly what they are. They are in that chapter of systems that create insecurity, but some massive, like it's like 5% or something of the world is that, um, you know, wealthy white European, you know, this particular kind of person I get or whatever. I don't know. I'm not saying that right, but like, in other words, most of the world is sort of a that. certain demographic. Is There's a demographic. That's exact. But the, that's the demographic that has been going through these universities and uh, European, you know, education. And if you think about just, you know, who's a therapist, it's going to be, you know, there's, it's pretty homogenous typically. 
um, traditionally. But then, so then all this research is happening on these kids that often also are white. Now, again, we say that the research is 70 years old. That's that it started 70 years ago. This is the most research concept in psychology. Uh, so it, there's tons of more recent research. And I just want to put that in there. So it's not, we're not just referencing that. There and is expanding to a lot of different cultures too. It's right. Not, and yeah, there is culturally, culturally. Absolutely. And a lot of people will say, what do you mean it's not cross-culturally, you know, researched? Um, Mary Ainsworth, the very first attachment, you know, observations were in Uganda. And that is true. But what you, you know, to your point, the person who's looking. And, and Filtered these are through great her people. lens. Exactly. Yeah. I love Mary Ainsworth. Without sure. Mary Ainsworth, John Bilby would not be on the map. So this isn't anything critical about any of these people at all. And but it's more we're just trying to bring attention to that there's an implicit you don't you only know what you know. And so you're seeing things through a certain lens. So an example of that is maternal sensitivity has a specific meaning in the literature. But when you go outside of that five of that small percentage and just look at how people raise their kids in the world, there's massive diversity. And what matters more is in that particular child's environment and at that time that they're born because even if you think about it in one family you parent kind of differently your first kid and your second kid and your third kid so when people talk about cultural things it's there's more differences within a culture than between cultures you know there's differences within a family a, a mother to a grandmother so it's you know, we never want to like lump um oh these people do it this way anything like that but the but the just the idea is that the if the, you know, what the culture and that the child is born into makes them healthy and functioning in their culture in that at that time, that is that is sensitive parenting. And that's going to look really, really different depending on where you're looking. So it's it's and, it, and it's important because we also have the power. And so what we say is healthy parenting becomes codified. And you start showing up in child protective services. It shows up in the criminal justice system. It shows up in, um, you know, people can have their kids taken away, especially if they come in from another culture and come and you're, you know, I used to work at child protective services. I thought I was helping kids. Now I know I was enforcing these state ideas of what parenting should look like. And I can guarantee you it was not equal across. They're only uh, being enforced on certain groups. Exactly. Socioeconomically, yeah, sure. it wasn't equal color it wasn't equal i didn't know that at the time but that is those mm -hmm. are the kinds of unlearnings that we're interested that i'm interested in and really doing right now and i'm really glad you're leaning on the unlearnings because you know you talk about Mary Ainsworth. well we are mary Ainsworth. that's this right time. that's right right we're going to discover as we go around we have to unlearn 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 right now all the things that we've learned and that's part of our journey what have, what are our biases and our assumptions based on what is healthy parenting Right. And then let's think about individuals out there. What, what were they taught about by their parents? What is, what is healthy parenting? What is protecting yourself from maybe somebody of a different culture? What are you taught? Right. And then what are those things that you want to integrate? But what are those things that become familiar to you because you were taught that? But when you stop to think about it, you have to really go, Hey, I've got a mother and some of what I've been taught. And that's a, that's a journey because to unlearn something, every single one of us has to get uncomfortable and we have to really question. And I think that's part of what I'm distressed about right now is that there's so much discomfort in the world and so much pain between me to be in. I mean, if you're not in pain right now with all sorts of things. I mean, what's, what's uncomfortable is real and we need to be that aware racism and climate change and hostility against each other. But I think we have to look at our own discomfort. You know, I was talking earlier about getting mad and say, those people, when I'm mad at those people, that's bringing my body a lot of comfort. I've gone from fear and, and uncertainty and helplessness to rage and anger at those people. Well, now my body in that moment feels more comfortable because now I've gone from feeling helpless to feeling right and mad and angry. So in that moment, I feel really comfortable. And so our journey is that we have to go through the discomfort of what it's like to be unstable and uncertain and scared 
and not to live there, not to live there, but to be able to tolerate it, to be able to then rely on connections to come our body and then to get us involved together. We all need each other right now more than ever related to you know, climate change, for instance. We have to work together. We can't just be selfish and inviting, right? And so the more we can all learn to deal with discomfort and then stay in connection, that's the goal. Secure relating is being able to tolerate your own discomfort and awareness inside, but also still connect to the other person. It's not easy. It sure isn't. But it is a worthwhile goal right now for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's clear that the old ways aren't working, <laughs> you know, I mean, like let's start another war or let's, you know, like try to suppress another group and, you know, but then there's also ways that um, misinformation is being used to keep people focused on a certain common enemy instead of, you know, paying attention to what's really going on. Like, you know, just, you know, make trying to tell people, Oh, the problem is immigration. It's the immigrants coming into this country who are causing all the crime. And that's what you should be worried about, like stopping immigration. And of course that's not true, but you know, if you strike fear in people's hearts and make them, Oh, I want crime to get better. I want to be safe. I want my children to be safe. I want my family to be safe. I think one thing that we forget is that everyone wants to be safe and everyone wants their families to be safe and the franticness and the fighting and the, you know, um, division and is not making anyone safer. And I would, we safe. a lot of, well, I would even say that that is intentional that, yeah. For some keeping everybody, keeping everybody's amygdala fired up, then we're much, and this is just true factually that you, you're easier to, it's easier to control yeah. people if they're afraid. Um, we, we look Divide for and conquer. That's right. So it's by design to some degree, even like marketing is like, you know, um, uh, red light special, you know, for limited time, you know, it creates a sense scarcity of scarcity based, yeah, scarcity based and it works and it works really effectively. And so this conversation about learning uh, your own dysregulation patterns so that you can move yourself, it's actually um, revolutionary. It's, it's kind of counter intelligence of, oh no, we're not going to let you um, lead us into this misinformation which is almost impossible with AI and everything like that. It's, it's, but all of that makes us feel uncertain. We're uncertain who to trust. We're uncertain if the photo that we're looking at is even real or the voice that we're hearing is even real. So our poor bodies and our poor nervous system, it's like, I have so much, I just wish I could give the whole world like a big nervous system hug of like, oh, okay, let's breathe and exhale and we're, you know, we need each other, like Ann said, and uh, let's do this together. We're going to really need to support one another. So, you know, the, the big fantasy would be, you know, everywhere that this little book lands, you know, we create these little circles of, <laughs> of security and that we find each other and that we keep through your podcast, through an infinite number of community-based groups, um, indigenous-based wisdom of ritual and song and there's so many it doesn't require individual therapy there's so many ways to heal and collectively yes collective healing this is collective trauma it requires collective healing and we have so much more in common than we have difference and yet we're amplifying the differences like i think about the two coaches on a little league team it's like that team our team that team our team and you're doing it to rile them up to go out there and you know so that works in the short run, but we have so much more in common, whether we believe in guns or we don't believe in guns. Like we all want safe schools, right? Like nobody who wants gun rights is saying, I love it when somebody walks in and shoots up a gun at a school, right? Like we have a lot more in common and talking about our commonalities and coming to connections is going to be a lot more productive than thinking somebody that believes this is evil and somebody that doesn't believe this is uh, you know, so it's, it's all about being able to have those connections and conversations that are hard. That I really they love are. what both of y'all are saying, you know, about like if all of these kind of ripples, it's amazing. 
Yeah. Well, when you think about misinformation and you think about um, division and us versus them, us versus them, Sue knows as a social worker, and Anne, you probably have heard this before too, but you have to ask yourself, who's benefiting from this? Yeah. A great question. And when in social work, you answer that question with follow the money. Like who benefits if, you know, everybody's terrified and, you know, prison systems and, you know, how prisons are huge employers. And if you don't have a whole bunch of people to put into prison, what is going to happen to those people that are working in the prisons? Well, what's going to happen to that small town? It's their whole economy. Well, it's not an okay reason to incarcerate people unjustly, you know? So we need a lot of reforms, but what we can do here is work on our own internal worlds and our relationships. And that's, you know, I mean, we can do more than that. We can <laughs> be activists too, but um, in terms of how you, even how you approach things, when you look at um, a lot of the movements are so driven with anger and um, urgency and that's like finite. You can't keep that going. You can't stay in that state of hyper arousal right. or para right. nervous system activation just indefinitely. Right. And as a matter of fact, that's another argument for this kind of regulation. It's not, um, you know, we all need to go and take care of ourselves. It's, just what you're saying, we go in, we regulate, we connect with our people, then we go out and fight. And, yes. you know, there is a Together. reason for the rage, right? And um, so it's it's both. It's, right. it's going in, filling up, going out, coming back in. Um, right. Because there are real things to be out there screaming about. But, yes. but also, Laura, I've noticed this too, that Although there's a role, it's like there's certainly as a white woman, privileged woman, I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody how to feel or how to protest, period. Like I, I'm learning, I mean, I'm getting more and more what the just overwhelming rage is about. But no, me too. But in advocating, if you're yelling at somebody, you're firing up their amygdala, they're defending, you're not going to be as effective. So I'm not saying that that doesn't have a place, but I love Loretta Ross's work about, you know, we really want to be bringing, calling people in and bringing people together. And so even when there's a big difference, this idea of safety and, and maintaining safety, if, if I can keep you in your regulated place, I'm going to get much further in my arguments and in my influence um, and be more powerful in the change that I want to see uh, at least that's one, that would be one prong of the fork. Like, again, I'm not meaning to say everybody should be nice. That is not at all what I mean. I mean, be bold and big and I'm just saying be effective and what is effective in your cause. And it's probably going to have something to do with being, not being reacted, you know, not just being, it'll be something about having yourself and being self-possessed and being aware of your listener and how they're doing, which is, that's what secure relating is about. And bringing it, Back to the individual relationships. It's also what works in relationships, right? Yeah, with Just our kids. It back to self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with kids. Partners. Partner, yeah. I think her <sighs> dog is snoring. Hang on a second. <laughs> Be sure and leave that like, in. This is a good microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, so your know, dog my, is my purely that relating right mean, now. Yeah. <laughs> that might mean that we've gone on too long. We've got a, a, an active <laughs> snore in the background. <laughs> we, we put our dog to sleep. My dog to sleep. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really grateful for what you're sharing and what you're doing and what your effort is to um, help people change, you know, their own nervous systems and their nervous systems in relationship to others because we're not – we're interdependent beings. We're not, you know, we can't, no man is an island. We can't live without others. And um, I'm really excited for you. 
Well, I don't want to say one other quick thing just as a slight, um, but about attachment. And I, I, I doubt anybody in the world will be even tracking this or whatever. But one of the things that I think was really important is that we're not throwing out, we're not countering. It's not that attachment isn't real. It's so real. It's still real, but it's confusing and it's muddled. And we're trying to, we're trying to actually bridge all of that great research and science and make it usable um, for the more people. So actually amplifying the research. So just in case that came across wrong, it's like we're joining in the, the, these, you know, our, our, uh, our ancestors who created and developed and researched all of this. It's, it's not uh, against anybody. It is more of like, let's get more clear and update what, what we're actually mean and what is actually helpful in session and, uh, and, at the dinner table in all the places. Um, and then also, I just want to say that we did push the concept and moved it in ways that it hasn't been moved before. But, and we were really nervous about that. We were like cringing when we were doing this, like, oh, what are people going to say? And so we got the, you know, the attachment researchers, Carol George read the chapter, um, Alan Shroof, who, um, you know, if you all know about attachment, these are the gurus in attachment. Uh, Carol George is directly related to Mary Main who, you know, is Ainsworth, you know, it's right there. So they gave us our, their blessing. And then also all the neuroscience folks, you know, Porges read a chapter and, um, you know, Dan Siegel has read the book and has totally given his thumbs up. It's, we almost, what we did, I did cry a little bit when I got his in particular, because he's such, he's such kind of a father figure, certainly of the field. But I think I was holding him in mind of like, oh, what's Dan going to think of this? You know, kind of cringing. Mm. And he was so enthusiastic. Um, it's like, it's so meaningful. So I feel like, okay, we have the blessings of some of these really the people that it would matter to um, and that would be able to tell us like, no, 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 you've gone too far or something. So I thought that was important of like staying connected to the field and just extending it a little bit versus mm -hmm. like taking some weird right turn or weird left turn. I know that some of your listeners are, I mean, many of your listeners are therapists because you go so deep in your content. And so do you have kind of an exciting thing coming up on May 4th? So if you're a therapist out there and this is interesting, to walk from, we have a workshop or a conference, a Monday conference in Austin, Texas. I mean, uh, we're going to be diving really, really deep on this, um, on everything we've talked about today, within systemic and properties and things like that. So, so it is going to be awesome. It is yeah. going to be killer. It is not your ordinary conference, I promise you. So we would really love for you to come in and join us for that. And there's also the night before we're doing a public talk in case you are more local or if you are coming in for it, where we're going to, um, it's for, <laughs> we kind of really have this in mind for, you know, your therapy client that has a spouse that's not that interested, but kind of is interested and is listening. This talk is for them. <laughs> so whether it be clients or client spouses or our own spouses or parents or teenagers, it's just a short talk, but it's going to kind of give the basics um, and kind of get people up to speed of the updates and and the walkout with really usable, um, like a work, you know, a worksheet and stuff like that. That's free. That's in Austin, Texas on May 3rd. 3rd. That's right. So yeah, we would love to have you. Oh, one more thing. Um, there is a virtual book launch. So anybody listening anywhere can join us live. Robin Gobel is going to be our host and our interviewer. That is May 1st at three o'clock central. You can sign up for that through our website. And uh, you could talk with us directly. We just be very interactive and just, we'd love to celebrate with all of you. So yeah, those are a couple of dates coming up that are fun. Congratulations. It's so exciting. And your book's coming out on April 30th, you said 2024. That's right. What'd you think about it? You took a look at it. You ha uh, I haven't had a chance to read it, to be okay. honest. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Emotional honesty. No, I that's emotional that. honesty. That's what we were talking about. I love emotional honesty. I don't know Thank where you, it puts Trish. me on the attachment spectrum, but I can't lie. I'm a really bad, that's bad really, liar. That's, that's so I feel green. so awkward when I lie yeah. that I just don't. Oh, I get it. Just like, that is sorry. Green. That's well, secure. That's secure, right? You're like, you're going to say is something that might disappoint us, which it didn't. But, um, <laughs> but you're trusting that we're going to be okay. And you're going to be honest. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's one way to look at it. I'd say it's really like, 
I'm too afraid to lie and get caught. So <laughs> if I do, I know that I would feel so ashamed. I would just like fall into a puddle. So I have to just be like, it's defensive. I didn't truth. read it. I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> you <call me. laughs> Don't. I regret uh, I re- me a little lower to the red like me. Like, I, I regretted. I regretted asking you the minute I said it. <laughs> it's on my face. <laughs> well, I just want to say that what I heard you saying about attachment is not throw out the concept of attachment. I heard you saying, let's look at this a little bit differently. Let's expand the way we're looking at it outside of these simple, overly simplified, which I'm going to name every time we are making things seem complex, things seem overly simplified. That's a, that's an effect of colonization too. It's like, you know, the patriarchy says, you know, there's good, bad, there's right, wrong, there's black, white. Everything's very simple. And the truth is that that is not the reality of life. It's not meant to be. That's just not how it is. So having a way that, you know, you can map it and you can understand it, but it's in ca- it's capturing the full experience of what attachment experiences are. That's why I'd rather say things like attachment patterns or, uh, trends, you know, trends. Yeah. yeah. We uh, talk about leaning. Do you lean. lean red right now? Or are you leaning blue? You know, to be able to recognize that you're leaning one way. You don't live anywhere. And Laura, yeah. before we end, I also want to mention your, um, your directory, which I think is such a gift to Thanks. therapists. And that what I learned just before we got on was that it is more than just a directory because a lot of therapists are full, but it is actually a community and Laura herself gets on every week, not every week, four times a month. I mean, it's weekly, basically. Yeah, it's pretty um, much every week, except for the five week months. That's right. That's so five Wednesday so, months. <laughs> yeah. So certainly encourage you guys, if you're therapist and you're still with us through this conversation, <laughs> then the directory it's might be through. something that you would want to check out. We highly recommend it. Thanks. You're my, you're giving a little, uh, a plug for me instead of for yourself. So tell everyone, where can they find you and all of your wonderful offerings and your podcasts? Where are you? So just you can- everything's going to be at uh, therapistuncensored.com. And if you poke around that website, uh, the podcast, you can put, there's a search key. You can search for kind of what you're interested in. Uh, there's an events page. It'll have everything on there. Uh, and then there's the conference page. If you want to go directly to that, just go therapistuncensored.com backslash, con- or not backslash, it's actually a slash, slash conference. Um, and then what else? Yeah. And, and the, you can find, you can find the book just in it. We can go to securerelating.com or you can get it at Amazon. No, no, no. It's like securerelatingbook.com. Oh, thank you. Uh, we don't want to send people to the wrong place, but uh, yeah, securerelatingbook.com. And that'll, that has all, it shows all the endorsements that we've had, which are amazing and uh, gives you lots of places to, to buy it. And we encourage people to do their uh, local indie bookstores uh, if you can. And there is a link for one of those or several of those in there. Um, but yeah, Amazon, wherever you get your books. Fabulous. Well, thank you for what you're doing in the world. Congratulations on your book and the success of your amazing podcast and just who you are. And thank you so much for being my guests today on Therapy Chat. Thank you. We really you. enjoyed thank it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.